So I'm pumped that we have Heath Arvidsson joining us today. Heath is the Chief Geoscientist at K2Fly with over 30 years experience in the mining industry. He's known globally for his work in mine, mine value chain reconciliation and has technical strength in resource estimation and ore control practices. And today he'll be chatting to us about the self-learning ore body. So thank you so much, Heath. I'm really grateful for you taking the time. Great, thanks, Jess. No, it's a real, real pleasure. Really appreciate the uh, the opportunity. So I'm just going to bring up my uh, my screen here. Well, good day, everybody. Thanks for for joining in. Um, I'm really keen to talk about this topic. It's something that's that's um, becoming more and more interesting. Um, you, you probably don't know what the hell I'm talking about with a self learning orbit. Maybe some of you got a, got a clue. There's there's some other terms out there that are similar, and I think there's some overlap between these terms. You know, di digital twin is one, um, which kind of, you know, people want to build a, a virtual mine, a virtual reality, mostly for remote control purposes. The other term out there is smart mine, um, which which kind of implies that there's, there's something smarter happening with the mine and there's technology and, and that's all good. But I, I kind of... I like this term self-learning all body because it gets to a purpose. And, and for me, um, as just mentioned, I'm really passionate and involved in reconciliation work. And, and I've seen so many minds that don't make enough, they don't get enough value out of the reconciliation work. And, and, and that's how we learn as we mine about the all body. We get to see it, we get to dig it up and look at it and learn about it and see it. And with new technology coming on, we can do that even better and in different ways and really interesting ways. So I'll, I'll get to more detail about what, what I think a, a, a slob is. Um, but first, I want to talk about, uh, about why. And in fact, the, the talk today is pretty simple. You know, why? Uh, why do we want to do this? Well, why do I think? I think there's a lot of people out here who want to, who want to do this. But what is it exactly? Or what could it be? And then how, how would we do something like that? What are, the, what are the ingredients that we need to make that a reality? And then who cares? What does it mean for people? And obviously there's some, some real challenges out there. So I'll, I'll highlight a few of those and, uh, and just finish up with a few conclusions. So, so that's it for today. Here we go. So why, why would we want a self-learning ore body? Um, I think one of the drivers is safety and, and there's a push in a lot of companies to get people out of the mine. And I think initially I thought, that was a bit dumb because how can a geologist do their job if they're not in the mine? They, they need to be, you know, in there licking the rocks and kicking them around and feeling them and, and smelling them and doing what they do. Um, but I think technology has come along where it, it's it's conceivable now that's you know a lot of the work that a geo does in the field could be done remotely, could be done remotely. Um, and if we can get people out of the mine, then it will be safer, and that's a good thing. I think uh, obviously cost and revenue is a big driver. And, and I think, you know, with, with some of these new technologies being applied and automated, we will see mining become more precise and therefore there's less waste rocks going through a processing plant, there's less cost and you start to increase revenue, increase, increase recovery. And I think by, by applying this technology and automating what you can automate, what's sensible to automate, um, you, get, you actually get a mortal operation and more sustainable operation. I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, I think there's there's efficiency gains and speed, which empowers people. You know, I've seen in my time a lot of people doing really low value work, um, grinding away, trying to find data, trying to clean it, trying to make it usable, trying to understand it. And and I just think a, a lot of that work can and should be automated to get efficiency gains and to get people really focused on the, the right questions and the right decisions that need to be made. I think with a really robust reconciliation process connected to a, a self-learning all body, we start to have much more transparency about what's going on in the operation and what's going on with the ore body. There's always uncertainty in the ore body when you start mining. You know, it doesn't matter how good you think your model is, it's always wrong. There's always uncertainties and you get surprises. And the sooner you pick that up, uh, the better. You need to have transparency and not on a yearly basis, much more, you know, if we can get that down to within a shift, then I think, you know, we're going to really see the risks and opportunities as they present themselves. Um, the next, this next topic, technical assurance, is is um, an important one. 
So I think um, if we do start to uh, automate processes and track what's happening through the process, then we do lift the bar in technical assurance. We can see what's happening. We can see who did what. We can start to start to understand the rationale for decisions. And that's the key thing, being able to discover what people were thinking when they made a decision and what data they used. I think that leads to more confidence in results and decisions. And, and I'll talk a bit more about this later on, but there, you, know, there, you guys all be aware that there is an increasing level of scrutiny on what's happening in mines. Uh, and for very good reasons, you know, there's been some real disasters. So technical assurance is a hot topic. And I think we've got to a point now where, you know, mining's been booming for a while, been through a few cycles in the last decade that have um, enabled people to explore new technologies, but also old technologies and just uh, figure out how to apply them. You know, we've got new sensing technology, there's scanners, there's, there's tracking technology, the, the computer architecture and capability is changing. And, you know, this is about working in the cloud and, and setting up massive servers so that we can really throw some computing power at problems. I think, we're, you know, this is a real paradigm shift from 10 years ago where we're, you know, trying to do things with desktop applications, um, just, just really clunky, you know, proprietary data formats that, that, that you couldn't break open. Those sorts of things are going to be a thing of the past, I think. There's also the, the mobility aspect, and it's, you know, giving people tools they can use in the field. There's, there's algorithms, some of which are new, but some of which are pretty old, but they're just being applied now because the computing power is there. Uh, you know, like machine learning, that's, that's been around for a long time. And oh, similarly, optimization, algorithms and optimization techniques. So those are some reasons that I think uh, the slob is a good idea. What is it? Okay, I'll paint a picture. So I think about this in terms of a value chain, and this is just a generic value chain. Um, you know, we, we do some drilling, we interpret that, we analyze it, uh, the, the other data, mapping data and you know, remote sensing or whatever we've got, we build a model and, uh, and using that model, we develop some plans. And this, this happens um, right throughout the life cycle of, of a mine. And then when we get into operations, we, we drill and blast, we load and haul, we, uh, we manage stockpiles, we crush rocks, we uh, put them in a process plant, um, some of them come out as a product for a customer and some of them come out as tailings and waste material. Uh, but really from, from the point of starting the operation, that's a pretty linear process. You only get to mine it once. So um, it, it's, it's linear from there. But at the front end, we, we iterate that all the time. We're always getting new information. We're always interpreting and modeling and trying to improve the plan, make the plan more realistic, more accurate, more achievable. And I think now with modern technology, what I'm seeing and what this process is seeing is a lot more data and, and different types of data. So I've just got some examples here. This is, this is not uh, the full gamut by any means, but just to, just to make the point, you know, in, in a drill and blast process, we're getting measure while drilling data. We've got uh, blast movement monitoring where, you know, we're using images to see what, um, a fragmentation distribution looks like, understanding power factors. We've got um, you know, geophysical logging now happening in blast holes as well as exploration holes. And we get all sorts of information about quality. And what I mean when I say quality, it's not just about grades anymore because we're starting to get information about minerals. And that's what we mine. We, we mine minerals and we, we need to understand the behaviour of minerals through this whole value chain. So we drill it, we blast it, then we start digging it up. And uh, we've got these fleet management systems that, that are used to optimise the utilisation of equipment. But the, the side benefit of that is that we now have um, a location of where something was mined. We've got some characteristics that come out of an ore control model, for example. And then we have a destination where that material goes to. So we can start to track material. We've got the ability to track material. Not, not, you know, not all mines actually do this. Uh, this data is, is poorly loved in some places, but it's incredibly valuable, particularly when we get to managing stockpiles. A lot of operations put 100% of material through stockpiles to, to blend and control the feed to the plant. I don't, I don't think I've ever been on a mine where 100% of material went directly to the plant. They always get, there's always some portion and substantial portions going through stockpiles, and those stockpiles are just assigned an average grade. Um, and then, but 
that's not really all that useful, actually, unless you consume the whole pile within a shift, which maybe maybe that happens in some cases. But with this fleet management system data, we can start to build three-dimensional granular models of stockpiles. And that's happening on, on a lot of mines now. And it's incredibly useful and valuable for a mine planner to be able to use that sort of model to schedule the material movements um, into the plant. So that's just one of my little hobby horses, uh, managing stockpiles, because I think it's, it's ironic that we do all this work up front. We generate a proven reserve in the ground. We mine it. We put it on a stockpile and now we say it's an indicated resource because we've lost control of it. That to me is uh, um, not only ironic, but moronic. We should be uh, doing better than that. Okay, so now our rocks get into the crusher. Again, there's belt scanners and all sorts of technology gathering information. And now we're also starting to see things like uh, power consumption and water consumption information. And if we can tie that back to the rocks and the location in the ore body where they came from, we can start to, to make much better predictions about similar rocks. What's, what's, what's their behavior gonna be when they get into a plant? So there's a, there's a wealth of information that happens in crushing and processing and reagent consumption is another one, that if we can tie that back to the rocks and their location, if we spatially enable that information, it's incredibly valuable for improving the planning and learning about the ore body. And then hopefully we get a happy, happy customer uh, right at the end. But as I mentioned at the start, the, the beating heart of the slob is the mine value chain reconciliation process. Um, you know, I've seen mines that have been doing very little in reconciliation. They've gone through a journey. Usually it takes a few years to formalize a process and to get some discipline around it. And as they do that, they're looking at the data, they're looking at the quality of the data and, and trying to improve it. And, and as they go through that journey, you know, they're adding, you know, some mines I've, I've seen five to 10% increase in, in revenue by just being more aware of what's happening in the mine, having some data with which to make decisions. Um, and so for me, that's the thing that ties all this together. The reconciliation process is about comparing your, your initial models to what happens in the mining process and what happens in the, the mineral processing uh, plant and then learning from that and, and coming back and improving the model. And at the moment, that, that's usually a really clunky, difficult manual process. But I think I can envisage a world where we can automate a lot of that and use some of these new algorithms and computing power to convert what we see, to, to exploit the correlations between the different types of data and start to update our all control model so that our planning becomes a lot more accurate and we can control this whole process much, much better. Um, so that's, for me, that's what I mean when I say self-learning all body. It's about exploiting all this new, these new types of data, tying them together and feeding it back into the model, updating the model. And, you know, for, for me, the, this all control model, the short-term planning space, that needs to be high granularity, high confidence for at least 12 to 18 months ahead of the mine so that we can make mines more stable and really understand what's going on. So that's a few thoughts for me about what a self-learning ore body is. I'll go on to the how. how. How could we make that a reality or approach that? So the first point here is about people because I think that's, that's one of the biggest hurdles. The, the people and change management challenges are significant. There's a lot of people involved and they've all got their own agendas. And I'll talk a bit more about these people challenges uh, later on. I think a, a key um, piece to making this a reality is having systems that are they're agnostic to other systems. They don't care what other systems are in place. They're just open and able to integrate with them easily. That's the sort of platform um, that, the larger companies are starting to build. So they're, they're, they're moving away from desktop applications. They're moving away from proprietary data systems. They wanna have a, a, a data platform that they can plug and play specific applications into solve specific problems. And I think that that's, makes a lot of sense. And they're doing this in a web-based way so that they can take advantage of the scalability that they can get from uh, just throwing more servers and more computing power at it. So for me, the, you know, if we've got 
a solid data platform and it's web-based, then we can start to see the slob coming closer. And related to that is having spatial data coupled with temporal data in the one environment. These things, when, when, they're, when they're combined, are very powerful. It gets back to that point I made earlier about if we're learning something in the process plant, I really want to understand where in the ore body that material came from. What were the minerals? Um, what was its location? What, you know, what, everything about the geology of it so that I can improve my predictions. Big opportunities to automate the hack work. Hack work. Uh, let's, let's apply these algorithms to, to making this um, technical work much more efficient. There's still big opportunities in this space, in my opinion. Um, ore blocking is a good example. Um, so there's, you know, there's, there's tools out there now that geologists can, can use, ore mining engineers can use, to, to generate um, ore block designs with, with an optimizer tool. It's like Whittle for ore control, right? So, um, but I want to do that for a whole bench ahead. For, so I've got that 12 to 18 months uh, already blocked out and I can, I can play with the constraints in that optimization process and, and run a whole bunch of iterations, different alternatives, and scenarios and start to understand where my uncertainty is, where the risks and opportunities might be. And I can do that really, really fast. I was working with a mine recently that it's, it's really quite complex and most mines are. If, if someone tells you a mine is simple, then don't believe them, that's my advice. But, but they really wanted to get to this world where they, they could block out a whole bench because that allows them to get much more efficiency in their load and haul process. They know exactly, you know, they can design the blast much better and much bigger um, and minimise the dilution and all losses. And, and it was taking their geologist a week to, to generate an ore block design just for one blast within that bench, let alone the whole bench. They couldn't actually, they couldn't actually achieve a whole bench with the manual approach. They had to automate it. So that's, I think, I think that's a really interesting example. And the other, the other related challenge in that is that there's more data that a geologist or an engineer has to consider when when designing all blocks it's not just it's not just a grade or a grade equivalent that needs to be considered you know but now that we've got information about physical properties from measure while drilling now that we've got information about mineralogy from from scanning and and uh, and whatnot we've got to consider all that as well to get that extra few percent and optimize the process i think Feeding the right people with the right info at the right time to make decisions is, is critical. And if we're still working in a manual process with different technical silos, this is really clunky. It's really clunky. And I've seen things fall through the, the gaps and not get done or, or miscommunication happen. With systems these days, we can automate workflows. We can, we can design a workflow and then have the system help us feed the right people with the right info at the right time. I don't have to go scrounging for it and you know, have uncertainty about what's the right information. That can be streamlined. Continuous feedback and communication. That's, that's what systems can help us do these days. And, and with a good cross-functional reconciliation process, uh, we start to do some silo busting. And, and you need the different perspectives from the different disciplines uh, because they see different things. They care about different things. And by coming together as a team and working together, you get those different perspectives and you get the right outcome in terms of uh, making sensible compromises and, and streamlining the whole process. So for me, all of these things are ingredients in realizing the slob. Who cares? Well, I think I mentioned you know, the technical, technical professionals should care because I, I think this does free them up from some hack work that they don't actually like doing. You know, some people really do like doing that detailed uh, data analysis and so forth, but a lot of people don't actually enjoy that. And it just, they see it as a waste of time and, and quite often it is. Let's get them focused on making decisions, higher value decisions and focused on continuous improvement. I think for managers, managers, uh, managers uh, should desire a slob because um, they start to see performance more in real time. They get to learn at a higher frequency so they can better optimize future performance. They, they get notifications when issues need attention or decisions need to be made or validated. They can demonstrate a value add and demonstrate technical assurance, which is really important and, and a hot topic. And I think all of that leads to more stable and predictable operations for, and 
all stakeholders benefit from that, from the board, management, the investors and regulators. Through that technical assurance, we're actually we're actually lifting the bar on ESG, and then and that's getting a lot of uh, scrutiny these days. And it's not just about the governance piece. You know, technical assurance is a form of governance. You know, by by controlling these processes better, we we make sure that we mine to design, so our waste dumps are in the right place. They contain the right materials. We get the right you know the ex expected environmental outcome. So the challenges. Um, there are some significant challenges, and I, I think three of the four here that, I've, that I'm highlighting are related to people. So it's, it's, it can be very difficult to make the value proposition clear um, because mines are complex. And when you first go onto a mine, you'll see that there's improvement projects happening right across the value chain in different disciplines. And if you go to the, to the mine manager and say, oh, I, you know, here's a project, I'm gonna increase your recovery by 3%. They'll go, well, yeah, how are you going to do that? Show me how that's actually going to work. Where's the value coming from? So it can be a real challenge. And that's why I think that it needs to be a coordinated approach across the organisation. And that is a huge challenge, particularly for bigger organisations, getting people on the same page, uh, working together across silos, um, you know, really focused on a vision, a clear vision, um, being supported by um, leaders who who make things easy for people to do work, you know, those are, those are not insignificant challenges. Change management, you know, are people aware of why we're trying to make a change? Do they, are they aware of the advantages of a slob? Um, you know, can we get them to desire that future state? Can we see, can, can we get them to see what's in it for them? Um, you know, how do we get the knowledge to them so that they can work with a slob? How can we give them the ability, the tools and the processes and, and the training and the, and the resources to, to make it a reality? And then it's got to be reinforced over time. Otherwise, it won't be sustainable. So change management needs a strong focus. Uh, but none of this can happen without that technology integration and sustainability. Um, you know, I, I, I work with um, some large companies that have got some real problems because of the legacy systems they've put in place 10 years ago. It's so hard to break, or not break, but but transform. It's it, you know it's so inflexible. You can't uh, you can't easily bring in new technology because it's there's such a difference. Even over ten years, the technology is such a difference that it, it's really clunky to pull something out and put something new in and get the benefits from it. It's painful. So those are some of the big challenges that I see. So in in conclusion, we've eaten the pizza. Um, but I do think a slob is part of getting to safer, more stable, more sustainable operations. I think there's significant value and value for me is not just about dollars. It's about those ESG issues, about doing what we say we're going to do when we set out to, to run an operation and showing people that we did that, being able to defend our decisions, being able to make it transparent. Uh, I think that, you know, the technology is there. We can work with it. We can apply it. Uh, but change is, is really hard work needs a, a strong leadership and sustained effort. So thanks for listening to me uh, ramble on about a slob. Um, I hope it was a bit thought provoking and I'm looking forward to some questions and discussion. Thank you so much. Um, we have had some things come through. So what you're talking about seems to me to be veering towards systems engineering. Has mining ed engineering begun to embrace systems um, engineering principles? Um, have you looked at systems engineering in the aerospace industries for ideas applicable to mining management? Um, it's definitely about systems engineering. And I've done a bit of research on this recently. Um, you know, a, a system can be defined as a series of inter interdependent processes. So that's exactly what a mining value chain is. They're all interconnected. Um, and we pass information, we, we manipulate things, we run a process, um, and we have to think about a mine as a system. Um, in, if we're going to um, have any chance of optimising it and increasing value, we, we do have to start thinking about, about systems. And I know some companies recognise that, some, some don't, but there are some companies out there who really put some focus on that. I'm working with one company uh, developing a technical academy which, which I think is a fantastic initiative. And, and part of that was um, 
up front, we thought, well, what are the what are the guiding principles that we should be thinking about when we do our work? And you know, we should be should be thinking about value at all times. And as I said, value is not just dollars. We should be we should be thinking about systems and how how our initiatives are going to impact the system. This is why this is a, an advantage of a digital twin, right? So if we have got a digital twin of our mind, of our system, we can then start to simulate what might happen if we change a part of the value chain before we make the change in reality. So that allows us to make a really good assessment of the impact um, prior to making change. So that's a really good question. Thanks. Um, so there have been some others. Um, how many slobs are out there? How many slobs are out there? Ooh. If you go to Kalgoorlie. I don't know. I, I, I don't think I've ever seen a full slob in, in play. Um, and I haven't been everywhere. I don't know everything. Um, I, I've seen the, the big miners are working towards it. They've got pieces of the puzzle. You know, I've, I've seen 3D models of stockpiles and the system around that that works really well. Um, I've seen machine learning being applied to processing plants and learning about how to optimise processes. But I haven't seen that end-to-end value chain being tied together yet. I know there are some people working on that. I'm one of them. I'm trying to get involved in projects like that. Um, yeah, so the slob hasn't landed fully just yet. Yeah. I like Joe's point about, you know, making a slob is pretty hard. Yep. And, and might be more expensive for an existing mine as compared to a, a new mine. And I think there's some truth in that. If, you, if you're going to start a new mine, then you should definitely be thinking about a slob setup. Yeah. Yeah, there's um there's a lot of thanks and interesting talks and lots of great feedback coming through. So yeah, I'll um really thankful that you've taken the time to chat with us. And yeah, it's really interesting to see where this all goes in the future. So yeah, thanks so much for chatting with us. That was really cool. And um yeah, really appreciate your time. Thanks everyone for coming along. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for the uh, engagement, the questions. Really enjoyed that. Thanks, Jess.